This is Epicenter, episode 370, with guests Kane Warwick and Hazu. Hi, I'm Sebastian Cuchillo, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple. And if you're new to the podcast, be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Today, our guests are Kane Warwick and Hazu. Kane is the founder of Synthetics, and he was on the podcast Earlier this year on episode 325, and Hazu is a crypto researcher who's quite active on Twitter and who writes about DeFi and crypto. He also hosts a podcast called Uncommon Core. So in this episode, Sunny and Frederica speak with our guests about liquidity mining. Uh, we were going to do this episode earlier in the year, but for different reasons, it's only happening now. But I think that you know, having a little bit of distance from the surge uh, that happened in this uh, last summer actually makes for a much better conversation than if we had ended up recording it right in the middle of the boom. So this is a really information-dense episode. I listened to it once. I think I'm going to have to listen to it again to really grasp everything that was discussed here. But some of the things they talked about were you know, the history of liquidity mining, how it started, uh, where it sits relative to other crypto economic incentive mechanisms like mining and staking, how value flows, uh, things like impermanent loss, and how the market could evolve. One aspect which I thought was really interesting and I hadn't really considered before is who will own the customer relationship? You know, at the lower end of the stack, we have AMMs, and certainly it's possible to interact with them directly. Like anybody can go to Uniswap and you know use uh, the app directly. But as you go up the stack, you know, there's other uh, participants there that provide a lot of value for users as well. So you have aggregators, for example, you have wallets. And the question is, who will own that relationship with the customer? And I think that it's possible that most people will simply end up interacting with aggregators and their wallets and that AMMs and the kind of underlying infrastructure will end up becoming more of a utility, more of a commodity. One of the aggregators that I really like is One Inch. It's the leading DEX aggregator and it discovers the best trade prices across all DEXs. It's my go-to aggregator and I love that it shows me how much I'm saving in fees on every trade. I'll tell you a little bit more about One Inch later on, but if you want to check them out, you can go to epicenter.rocks slash one inch. That's the number one and the letters I-N-C-H. If you build a lot of WordPress websites like me, one of the things that you'll probably find most time consuming is frustrating is DevOps, deployments, maintenance, backups, and database management. The folks at cPanel have built the WordPress toolkit for cPanel, and it's a tool that makes it easy for you to manage your WordPress infrastructure. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. But if you want to learn more right now, you can go to epicenter.rocks slash cpanel. And our friends over at Algorand are hosting After Hours series where blockchain developers can meet with their team and other members of the community for informal conversations about Algorand. I'll also tell you a little bit more about that later on. But if you want to learn more right now, you can go to algorand.com slash epicenter. For now, though, here's our conversation with Kane Warwick and Hazu. Hi, this is Epicenter, um, and I'm Friederike Ernst. And I'm Sunny Ackerwall. Um, today we're having a bit of a special episode in that it's not on any one particular project. It's on liquidity farming in general. And we have two guests today, Kane from Synthetics, who we've had on earlier this year as well, and Hazu. Maybe both of you guys can give a very brief introduction on your backgrounds and who you are. Kane, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm the founder of Synthetics, uh, which is a uh, synthetic asset platform built on Ethereum. Um, so we allow people to get exposure to a range of different assets like gold, silver, oil, etc. Uh, yeah, I'm Hasu. Uh, that's a pseudonym, uh, not my real name, in case you wonder. Before crypto, I used to play online poker professionally for 10 years. I played pretty high stakes for a long time, but something that I increasingly learned was that I enjoyed the, the studying aspect of the game more than playing and basically discovering the hidden rules and strategies of the game and, um, and then teach that to others. So when I was done with poker, I looked for a space where I can apply that 
that same approach basically and um, I got very quickly sucked into crypto and I would assume you would all agree that crypto is like you have like a million strings around you and you can pull at any one of them um, for years and um, basically never get, never get to an end and um, I think that's so fascinating about it so yeah I basically do like research full time but I just do it for myself invest my own money and like for the last year or so I also run the research desk for Deribit. Deribit is uh, the largest options exchange in the space uh, so we write weekly um, research columns um, that's me and Suzu of three arrows and um, a few months ago we also started a podcast together called Uncommon Core so that's that's what I do pretty much. And it's super interesting. We are linked to it in the show notes. So if you guys need uh, more podcast fodder, I would totally recommend it. Cool. So let's talk about liquidity mining. So um, the entrance of liquidity mining has been somewhat gradual. So basically, if you like, look at the earliest instances of liquidity mining, where and when do you think it, you would say it, it actually started? I think my view is that there's been a few different iterations, right? But um, certainly, you know, things like uh, LivePeer, for example, um, you know, were early iterations of, uh, of trying to work out how to do some mining-like distribution uh, that wasn't at a base layer, right? Like, you know, something above the base layer that allowed you to distribute, uh, you know, uh, tokens or assets based on uh, some, you know, provable you know, piece of work that you were doing. Yeah, I agree. So, um, so one thing that basically I, like when I first about, heard about liquidity mining, and that was actually not um, when Synthetics did it, uh, which did it, was probably the moment when it went, when, when most people first heard about it, but when Compound did it this, this year and it basically like hit the mainstream in a big way. When I heard about liquidity mining, I immediately thought, okay, this is basically um, proof of work mining, right? This is basically like mining as we have it in Bitcoin or as we have it even in proof of stake, like Cosmos, but in a more generalized way. So in these network, like in networks like, like Bitcoin or like even the dApps, they are also like networks. If you want to think about them this way, you have different groups of actors and often like one group incentivizes the other to perform certain work for them. And um, yeah, that's basically uh, what we have in, in Bitcoin, right? So in Bitcoin, you have the users who want want to transact with each other, want finality on their transactions. And the way we get this is the, the users pay miners to collect transactions in a block and then attest to them with a cryptographic proof of work. And that proof of work is what creates finality over time because basically makes transaction history harder and more costly to reverse. I, I, I like that you brought up live peer because I also I wanted to go into that direction in terms of explaining it that so it all started kind of with Bitcoin, but then we already had back in the day like different um, basically the, the network incentivizing different things that were not just attestation of messages. Um, for example, we've had storage, right? So we've had like stuff like I don't know how to pronounce it storage, storage and, and then SIA, for example. So that's where actors in the system are uh, paid to basically provide uh, like store data and then provide proofs that the data exists and so on. Yeah. So I, I, the way I think about liquidity mining is basically is a generalization of that concept as it relates to providing financial liquidity. So in like storage and SIA, it was mostly like other users paying other users for like storing of data would that still count in this like liquidity mining or does liquidity mining necessarily imply that it's some sort of new supply that's being distributed i think for me it needs to be like a, a protocol level incentive right that's that's designed to bootstrap you know before people are willing to pay right or like augmenting what people are willing to pay um maybe that's not strictly necessary right um you know you could launch a network that immediately had sufficient uh, network effects that people were you know paying each other enough but at that point i would say you almost don't need liquidity mining you just have you know payments uh, so i i do think there is a component of it that's like about generating those network effects and, and bootstrapping yeah i think that's a that's a good point I mean, on the one end, we like if, if the Bitcoin, the block subsidy would go away, we wouldn't say Bitcoin no longer has mining, right? So it still has that aspect. But 
the way that we talk about liquidity mining, the way that it's used in, in the public discourse is basically synonymous to, to a subsidy that's, that's basically supposed to create network effects early on. I, w- I would agree. So when I think about liquidity mining, there's actually, I mean, obviously network, network effects and basically I would call that growth marketing in the broadest sense. Um, obviously, they play an important role, but there's also different aims here, right? So basically, there's programmatic decentralization um, to a certain extent. So basically, you want a broad distribution of your token and uh, an inclusive governance. And uh, you want, I mean, basically the entire fair launch movement kind of grew out of this. And you also ideally want close alignment between your own token holders and the people who use your protocol, right? Because, I mean, if you if you look at the token distribution after the 2017 ICO bubble, a lot of it was just for speculative purposes, despite the fact that almost all of these tokens were branded as utility tokens, but people held them for speculative purposes. Is the core aim for you guys of liquidity mining, is that growth marketing or does it have deeper ideological goals? I think it has two very practical goals and um, you basically touched on both of them. The one is always to incentivize kind of the the provision of some work or service to the network. And that's and you, you need that early on in two-sided marketplaces because the, the like, for example, on Compound, you won't get any borrowers unless you have lenders and vice versa. There are no lenders unless there are borrowers. And that's why it's important early on to bootstrap or to, to kind of provide an additional subsidy beyond the, just that uh, supply or the utility that you can already get. But the second is the initial distribution of supply. So you have this kind of fair launch theme, right? So that coins that had a fair launch, fair launch meaning that basically everyone had to pay to acquire the supply and everyone had to pay the same market price. That's that's kind of the, the definition. No, no one get any, got any coins for free. There's no pre-mine, no VC allocation. That basically, that's that's the, the fair launch. And we've seen that again and again, that coins that do have a fair launch get assigned a premium by the market. Those coins are seen as more valuable. Their distributions are seen as more fair, um, more egalitarian. And that's why more and more projects nowadays do it. And um, that's why you can also see liquidity mining, basically that, that different projects use liquidity mining in very different ways. If you look at um, Yearn, for example, Yearn distributed or also used liquidity mining, but basically there, there was like the kind of work they incentivized was just to lock up liquidity in a pool that no one can interact with. So it's just staking, but the staking doesn't serve anyone, right? Um, so it's completely useless work, other maybe that people go to the website and that it builds brand awareness and so on. But that's that's an example of a project that completely um, focused on the second part of liquidity mining, which is to distribute all of the initial supply into the hands of of the market. And that's what, what we earned it, right? It, I think it was two or three weeks and then 100% of all YFI was was already issued. I'd actually be interested in Kane's point on this because, I mean, at Synthetics, you actually started a fairly early liquidity mining program. So basically, what, what did you guys hope to achieve with it at the time? I think that, look, there's a lot to unpack uh, there, right? So, you know, I think that the... And we can go we can go into like fair launch and like what that means and like the ideology behind it but i think there's a practical aspect to it which is maybe missed right like there's correlation between fair launches and like very militant like devoted communities right but i think the causation is actually the wealth effect right it's it's the fact that you know people who mine bitcoin in the early days their cost base is a zero right the people who mine who liquidity mined Wi-Fi, their cost basis is zero, right? If you can get someone's cost basis down to zero, it, everything's upside for them, right? And I think that that, uh, you know, if you look at the projects that survived through the bear market in 2018, you know, at one point the price of uh, SNX was down to 2.5 cents, right? And there are people who are buying it, you know, for every seller, there's a buyer, right? And, and those people are deeply devoted, their livelihoods, their, you know, identities are, are very strongly tied to those things. And so I think that liquidity mining enables you to distribute tokens with 
effectively zero cost basis you know there's an opportunity cost obviously um you know but uh but i think that that creates maybe more alignment than people kind of realize that there is this you know there's an ideology and there's like a, a you know a fair component to it but i think there's also just like a pure economic incentive component one inch is a decentralized exchange aggregator that sources liquidity from the top DEXs and AMMs to save you money and time on swaps. One inch finds the best possible trading paths across over 20 supported liquidity protocols and splits them up across multiple market depths. I started using one inch last summer and since then it's become my go-to aggregator. I use it every time I need to make a swap. They recently launched V2, which has a brand new API. It greatly improves their routing algorithm and my favorite part about the V2 is the new UI. It's super clean and easy to use. These improvements ensure that you get the best rates on your swaps with the lowest possible response time. So the next time you need to make a swap, forget about getting the best rate or optimizing your gas fees. Make it easy on yourself. Just use one inch. And you can let them know that we sent you by going to epicenter.rocks slash one inch. That's one I-N-C-H. We'd like to thank one inch for their support of the podcast. So could you explain a bit about how did the liquidity mining process work in synthetics? What what exactly in the synthetic system was being incentivized and how did the process work? Yeah, so so we needed we had this like magical like walled garden, right? That you know, if you're inside of it, you had this uh, cool property where you could take any asset and, and go from one asset to another, right? Uh, with zero slippage. But you had to get in there first. Right. And the problem was that the walls were way too high and like there were no doors and it was just like you literally couldn't get into the thing. Right. And so we came up with this idea uh, within our discord to incentivize the, the lowest risk pool that we could in Uniswap, which was like the synthetic ETH, ETH pool. And, you know, there's very little risk for people in terms of impermanent loss. And we put incentives in there to essentially allow people to go in and out of that uh, pool and that was like the most liquid on ramp. But all of a sudden we had a door and people could like go into this magical place, right? So that was that was really the initial uh, kind of incentive, and then it grew from there. We we added different incentives and and different structures. So it was like more of a it was like incentivizing people the on ramp into the synthetic system to allow people to easily acquire the SNX token. No, the actual synthetic assets themselves. So, oh, so yeah, it was like you wanted to be able to, uh, you know, convert a synthetic dollar to a synthetic euro, for example, right? But you needed to get one of them first to start that process going. So we said, well, people have ETH. We've got a synthetic ETH. We'll create a pool that lets people go from ETH to synthetic ETH, and then you can make the next hop to any other asset. I see. I see. Why do it with like synthetic ETH instead of with SNX, which then could be converted into any of the synthetic assets i mean there were there were debates about like should we incentivize snx liquidity what with the real reason was basically in permanent loss risk right like the the only people that were going to be able to do it were fairly sophisticated about the risks of uniswap you know we didn't have the the masses uh coming in and providing liquidity in uniswap at that point right so there was a lot of skepticism around like who's going to step up and, and put snx and eth for example um, you know, into Uniswap and, and take on that IL risk. And tw 2019 was a different time, right? In terms of what coins had the most liquidity because stable coins had like below $5 billion or like even like way less than that of liquidity. And nowadays it's, it's like 20 and 30. So would, would you nowadays incentivize like the SUSD versus USD pools and not ETH versus SETH, for example? Absolutely. And, and we did when Curve came out, um, you know, we had the, the SUSD, DAI, USDC, USDT pool that was incentivized. Yeah, I think that synthetics is, uh, is really the exact opposite of, of Yearn, of the example that we gave. Basically, the, the subsidy said like zero purpose, right, other than distributing supply. And synthetics is like very picky about distributing supply. And you guys do basically like trial runs where you incentivize stuff for two weeks at a time to see how the different agents in the system react to these incentives. And if they don't react like you want them to, then you basically change the parameters or try something else, right? So that's, I like that a lot, yeah. So when we say liquidity mining, like 
does it have to be something useful that's being incentivized? So would we call the the urine incentivization or just like this idea of like, you know, generalized staking? Like, you know, when I staked all my tokens in the yams protocol, was that liquidity mining or is that something like different? And then even when we talk about liquidity mining, does it have to be literally liquidity that we're incentivizing or is something like live peer called liquidity mining? Yeah, I mean, that's why I think yield farming, ironically, you know, kind of took off, right? Because like farming is just like, doesn't really mean anything, right? Like, so you you know, there's a yield in this like, you know, governance token or, or protocol token that you're getting for far, like for farming it, which could be literally anything, right? So I think that's why a lot of people it resonated with, right? And I remember when it was first kind of coined, for me, it was like, oh yeah, like that makes sense. Like, cause it's not presuming anything. It's just like yield farming. It's, it's very adaptable. Yeah. And I, there wouldn't really be much point like for us to come up with any like definitions because we, we will have a hard time convincing the rest of the community to adopt them, but it's just a liquidity mining, like mining, generalized mining, liquidity mining, that's and yield farming, of course, that they are all used kind of synonymously. And, um, I mean, if I had to give an attempt, then I think like mining is the, the act of providing kind of cryptographically verifiable work for another party in the network. And that's incentivized by the protocol. And then it's basically liquidity mining when the work that you do is providing liquidity and it's yield farming when it's, that's basically what the user calls it when it feels like putting money in the bank account and then getting some kind of yield for it. It's. I haven't really seen it used in, in kind of when the work is not just providing liquidity. Kane, can you talk about the, your experience with Synthetic? So basically the people who provide liquidity in the incentivized pools, do they typically also become, you know, true users in the sense that they interact with the protocol when it's not, not incentivized? I think so. And I mean, you know, the interesting thing with the initial yield farming incentives that we had is we weren't directly incentivizing you to interact with the synthetics protocol, right? Like you had to get synthetic ETH, right? So you had to have it from somewhere, but you could have just bought it on Uniswap. So we were actually incentivizing people to use Uniswap, right? Which is kind of funny when the retroactive Uniswap rewards were were dropped on everyone and all these like early SNX people all of a sudden had, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of uh, uni for just being around in like 2019, right? And, and you know, maybe putting a few thousand dollars worth of liquidity in there. So I think it was it was initially incentivizing people to use Uniswap, but we got a lot of utility out of people using Uniswap and being LPs on Uniswap. That was kind of our on-ramp. And we thought, well, we better use this thing. It's going to be huge. Let's kind of, you know, uh, ride on the coattails of that rather than trying to kind of, you know, build our own liquid on ramp and, or, you know, build our own decks or whatever. So it was, it was about, you know, leveraging what was there. It's interesting that this kind of, this watershed moment for liquidity mining actually happened before liquidity mining went mainstream, like this intellectual watershed moment, because in DeFi, you can incentivize things that happen outside of your own protocol, because you can still observe that this thing happened, you know, and it's, it's cryptographically provable, which and different blockchains, different base layer blockchains have a lot of trouble verifying stuff that happened on on another blockchain. It's the, the kind of whole story behind the interoperability phenomenon. So yeah, that's what I think is the most interesting thing about DeFi, that you have this one highly composable database where everyone can interact with what everyone else is doing. Yeah, And, and liquidity mining is really us experimenting with programming like humans in this kind of composable environment. And it's extremely fascinating. Yeah, I think one of the things that became really interesting was the fact that like all the data on the chain is is readable. And so now you have the ability to access any sort of data and like incentivize it in a way that maybe wasn't possible before. To what extent do you think like AMMs were like very necessary in this uh, liquidity mining? I was pretty excited about this pro like project called Hummingbot that seems like never really took off, but it was basically like incentivizing market making on order book based DEXs, but it never really quite took off. Why do you think that was? I mean, you had to run your own infrastructure, right? Which just immediately filters out like 
percent of people, right? You know, I was before we jumped on here, I was like uh, sitting, unplugging and plugging in my DAP node, trying to like get uh, my uh, E two validators up and running, and like not having the right packages and stuff. Like, if it wasn't for it being E two, there's zero chance that I'm like doing bothering to do that right like i just wouldn't be um and so you know i like the idea of hummingbot but i i think it was too difficult uh you know versus something like uniswap where there was a learning curve like no question especially the early like ux was not amazing but like it's maybe four clicks right like five clicks and all of a sudden you're a market maker maybe not a very smart market maker but you're a market maker and you know you're you're there right so i just think that made it so easy for people who had these assets that were just sitting there in wallets doing nothing to go, well, like maybe I should, you know, I should put them into this pool and, and get some utility out of them and, and potentially some fees. Yeah. And for the other side as well, right? So the, there's very little point in providing liquidity. So something like Uniswap, when it doesn't generate fees, when the only people trading against it are the arbitrageurs, and then you kind of bleed out from the divergence loss. So I think like Uniswap and DeFi in general really benefited from this peer to pool model or peer to contract as it's also sometimes called where like something like Uniswap always will trade against you when you need it. And that's the kind of building block that a lot of other, like this kind of invisible building block that's actually the foundation of pretty much everything that's happening in DeFi because every project is in some shape or form uh, depends on being able to liquidate collateral of users, for example. And um, they all rely on, on Uniswap in order to, to get that liquidity when they need it and to, to, to be able to, to liquidate the customer's positions. And when you don't have that assurance that in, in any market condition, there is liquidity there, that someone will, will quote you basically liquidity, then these projects wouldn't work. So I think that's basically the, the invisible foundation for all of DeFi. I've been building WordPress websites for over 10 years, and the most frustrating thing has always been DevOps. I'm talking about deployment, maintenance, backups, and database management. I've lost so many hours of sleep doing WordPress infrastructure management. If you've been building websites for as long as I have, you're definitely familiar with cPanel. They've been providing web hosting management software for 25 years. Well, they have a new product. It's called the WordPress Toolkit for cPanel, and I've been given an opportunity to try it out. It's really cool. It makes managing your WordPress websites really easy. You can manage multiple WordPress sites from one dashboard and you can manage users and databases too. And because all your websites are managed from a single interface, you'll be more efficient. This is really useful if you're running multiple environments like staging and production. The WordPress toolkit can also apply security settings and policies to all your sites at once so you can harden and protect your company's website. There's a free light version and a deluxe paid version that has added features like website cloning and smart updates. That's also great if you're running multiple environments. Anyway, if you're doing anything with WordPress today, I would really encourage you to check this out because it'll make your life so much easier. To learn more about the WordPress toolkit for cPanel and be informed when it comes out, go to epicenter.rocks cPanel. That's C-P-A-N-E-L. We'd like to thank cPanel for their support of the podcast. Shall we talk about the elephant in the room, uh, that being impermanent loss? Anytime you're a liquidity provider on an automated market maker, as a liquidity provider, under what circumstances should I actually provide liquidity given that the underlying assets are volatile? I mean, okay, and that's kind of why you guys started with SEs against ETH, right? So what do you think the rational approach is here? I mean, it really depends on, on the intent of the person. Right. Like there's certain pools where if you've got a lot of one asset. Right. And, and this is where Balancer, I think, helps. Right. Uh, you know, it, it makes this a little uh, more palatable. Right. And it just opens up the number of people that can like rationally provide liquidity. Right. Or, or less irrationally provide liquidity, I guess, maybe. And, and so, you know, if you've got a lot of an asset and you're willing to sell that asset down continuously, for example, right? Um, and you're not going to just sit there and hold it and hope that at some point in the future, you can liquidate all of it at a better price, right? You're going to get a continuous price from whatever the, the ratio is now to whatever the ratio is in the future. 
And if you have a long time horizon and are comfortable holding both those assets, right? Like let's say, you know, you're holding Val ETH, right? So like I'm, I'm a Val ETH liquidity provider and balancer, right? And I'm very comfortable that balancer is a, an asset that I'm happy to hold, but I'm also happy to sell some down if the price starts running up, you know, so I'm, and obviously I'm happy to hold ETH. And so I think under those circumstances, it's totally fine to be in there and be in that pool as long as you understand what the, the trade-offs are, right? Um, you know, if you're someone who's saying like, I'm buying, I don't know, ETH today at 500 and I'm planning to sell it at a thousand and you want to wait till that target's hit and then like, you know, you shouldn't be providing liquidity in, in Uniswap. Like that's not going to get you that outcome. So, you know, I think it's very specific strategies that you want to be employing. But I think for the average person, it's like, I've got this thing, dump it in there, see what happens. And they don't really think too much about it. Yeah, I don't really have a ton to add to that. I think in general, people should be aware what they're buying when they're buying LP tokens. So structurally, when you put money into into an LP uh, liquidity pool, then what you basically sell the two assets that you put in and you buy an LP token. And um, well, that has very different behavior than just holding the two tokens um, initially. And um, I thought it was, or I thought we, we could, uh, there was there was a small chance that this would lead to disaster basically at the height of the def the last DeFi run up when the um, first sushi swap and then Uniswap um, and then all the copycats started basically everyone to um, become an LP even those that had never interacted with them before and they these people mostly had no idea what kind of financial product they're buying they're actually selling um, volatility basically and well. And nobody really told them that, right? So they were attracted by the allure of uh, the liquidity rewards. And um, but I mean, I think it all like the, the rewards turned out to be so big because the demand for these liquidity tokens on the market was so high that no one could have really lost any money there. So and I guess now a lot of people know how liquidity provision works and what they're actually buying. So it was a good education in that sense. But just in general, I think it's 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 good if if people who want to engage with this know that they're selling volatility and hence it is they should look at the correlation um, between the two assets that they're putting in. And um, the more correlated they are to each other on a longer time frame, the better. And that's why I mean, you see this that, that actually in, in the in the liquidity mining uh, rewards, which is interesting. Um, because that's basically the market telling you what is the cost of, um, of putting assets in there. So if you want to get a feeling for that, just look at um, the rewards, the different Uniswap pools and different um, balancer pools pay you. And the more you can earn, the more basically reward the market demands in order to be in that pool. So I thought that's a nice way to build intuition. Yeah, that's, that's a nice way of putting it. Can I kind of loop this back into the bigger economy. So basically you said liquidity mining was so profitable because uh, that basically no one no one could have possibly lost any money. So this is very counterintuitive, you know, coming, you know, from from a traditional uh, point of economics. Um so where did this money actually come from? Oh, I mean, I should clarify, I guess, what I meant with that one second to <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely lost money. I I, I will say that one hundred percent. You know, not not every time, obviously, but there were some uh, some cases. Um, you know, based was a really great example, right? Um, I managed to somehow buy like the absolute top, right? Um, so you know, I was I was uh, liquidity mining and based. I bought it like two hundred. Um, put it into uh, pool two, I think. And I was like, oh, this is going really well. Like I'll just, you know, double down or I think like 10x down actually is more <laughs> more accurate probably. And like bought a bunch of base at like 600 and then got utterly crushed down to like 150 and then capitulated at the bottom. And, you know, it was, it was a, a pretty uh, painful lesson and a permanent loss, right? Like, so, you know, there were other things obviously that, that I did pretty well in, but, you know, there were some examples where, if you like, even I would say somewhat knowing what you're doing, you could still get your face ripped off pretty effectively. Oh yeah. I should clarify that as Kane said that there were different pools that tend, they tended to have different labels and the pool one is basically, let's say you provide ETH BTC liquidity and then you get paid rewards for that. And it was, it was 
quite hard to lose on that because the divergence loss relative to fees is very small, if at all. Um, you mostly win without liquidity um, rewards even. But then there was there was usually a second pool called the pool two, and um, there you basically you, you you provided the 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 project's native token, let's say based against uh, some other uh, money, let's say ETH or USDC. And um, that was basically to provide um, exit liquidity for <laughs> the people, get, like entry and exit liquidity for those gambling on the, <laughs> the project. And the rewards on those were in the thousands of percent per year. But it was also incredibly easy to get wrecked in those pools because it was basically a game of chicken. Um, basically, when the, when the large holders wanted to exit, they could do it through this pool. And then the pool would immediately collapse because all the LPs would stay in there, they would end up with all of the, the these native tokens and they would sell off all of their ETH or their USDC. So yeah, it was incredibly easy to get wrecked there and um, many people did, for sure. Okay, so there were definitely pools where basically making money was not a given, but on the large, a lot of people got very rich with um, yield farming. So typically in the, in the, if you don't think at the scale um, of you know nations, money doesn't just appear out of nowhere. So what happened here? Is it is it a zero sum game or not? And if not, then where is the excess value coming from? Oh, I mean, it comes from the people buying the liquidity tokens on the market, right? I mean, look at Curve for example. So you get liquidity rewards in the form of CRV tokens in Curve if you provide liquidity to their pools, and uh, basically the the how high that reward is for you depends almost entirely on how much you can sell the CRV for on the market. And I don't know if you've seen it, but there was the meme that the C, the retail CRV buyers are actually the backbone or the foundation of the entire yield farming hype, right? Because someone has to buy these relatively useless tokens at the time anyway. And um, CRV for a time had a higher fully diluted market cap than Bitcoin even, right? So that was quite funny. Um, and it has, it has collapsed predictably, uh, I think over 90% since then. But so the money is not created from thin air in that sense. It's, it's coming from the people who buy, to, who buy these liquidity tokens. Let me dig in there. So basically the liquidity, I mean, basically the, the tokens that are for instance, in the case of Curve, it's a governance token, and most of these tokens are right. So basically, in a w would it be correct to say that in a way you're buying future equity or future to to become a shareholder or you know in traditional terms a shareholder of that project by buying Curve tokens retail? Are you in effect buying a bit of Curve? as a project so basically in a way do people actually incentivize with future bits of the project yes but the problem with curve is like you're the vision fund right buying it like 48 billion dollar valuation when the market uh you know doesn't really believe it right and so i think that my my sense is there's two sources one is reflexivity, right? Like these are highly reflexive assets that didn't exist, right? And people are holding them and believe, and we all believe collectively, like that there's some value to Curve or Uniswap or, you know, uh, any one of the like new crop of assets like Yam, et cetera, right? That, that kind of popped out of nowhere. And as long as there's enough of them and they're sufficiently distributed and like sufficiently uh, illiquid that some people are going to hold on to them and feel like they have value. That's where a big portion of the, this like new money came from, right? And then I think on top of that, you then had the fact that there was kind of energy coming into the system from uh, Bitcoin flowing onto uh, ETH for kind of the first time, right? Like we all of a sudden, so all this BTC, like just crazily flowing from somewhere, right? Like, you know, it wasn't doing anything sitting in my Kraken account, I'll tell you that much, right? And it's now all of my BTCs on Ethereum. So all of that BTC flowing in that is suddenly buying things like that purchasing power turned up. And I think it was a combination of a, a few of these different things that, that kind of created this new 
value, right? That, that previously wasn't, I mean, it was technically there, right? Because curve existed pre-token and had some value, it was generating fees, right? And all of a sudden there was now just this like tangible liquid-ish representation of what curve was, right? That was tradable and, and you know, you then multiply that by like 20, 30 different projects and you had stuff there all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, I would ag agree, and uh, I would also agree with you, Frederica. That I mean, these—it's definitely right to think about these gov governance tokens, even though they are called governance tokens, as a form of pseudo equity. And um, while it can look like—I mean, the, the the current buyers who are buy acquiring like CRV and these other tokens at uh, seemingly very high prices—if Curve would end up replacing kind of the large forex exchanges or whatever, um, then of course, it, that bet can also pay off, right? It's a, it's a sort of venture bet. I think that's the right way to think about it. And um, if it succeeds, then you would have incumbent financial service providers lose and uh, current CRV buyers win. Our friends over at Algorand are starting an office hours series. So every week or two, Algorand will bring together their team, partners, and community together for a live discussion intended to provide you with all the answers and resources you need towards building useful, meaningful blockchain applications. By joining Office Hours, you'll learn how to get started with command line tools and use the SDK and REST APIs to help you build applications for use cases like crowdfunding, asset tokenization, supply chain management, and gaming applications. Each Office Hour will start with a theme, for example, smart contracts or writing contracts in Python, followed by an open Q&A and chat. So if you're building on a blockchain protocol that has unfeasibly high or unpredictable transaction fees and doesn't provide you the speed you need, or if you work at a large enterprise or financial institution and are interested in learning how to build applications that can integrate with your current technology stack, or whether you have no blockchain experience at all and are just looking to take the first step into learning something new, Algorand could be the right solution for you. To learn more, visit algorand.com slash epicenter for developer resources and information about their next office hours. We'd like to thank Algorand for their support of the podcast. So, so far we mentioned the idea that like AMMs were important for like the rise of liquidity mining. A couple of weeks ago, we had SBF on, on the show and there, his claim was that like, you know, a lot of the incentive was the other way as well, that AMMs only took off because there was this giant amount of like liquidity mining that was incentivizing people to provide liquidity and that they probably wouldn't have otherwise. How valid do you see this claim? I mean, it's not a very credible claim. Like the, the data doesn't support, I mean, I guess it depends, right? On, on what your metric is, like how much volume, how much liquidity, but I mean, even curve, right? There were no incentives for, for curve, uh, you know, and, and there were two, 300 million in, in liquidity that was, uh, you know, in curve because it was generating fees. Like it was the best yielding thing pre like the crazy, you know, yield farming, like it was the best yielding, you know, location for your stable coins. Like it was the only yielding location for your stable coins. It was the only place where you could put your stable coins in fairly comfortably risk adjusted. The yield was amazing. Um, you know, so like that's been kind of washed out with like the, these you know massive returns from, uh, from seniorage, but like that was a good thing and it made sense and it was tangible. It was real. Yeah, and the week the week before Sushi Sushi Swap even launched, which was the first um, big scale liquidity subsidy for 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 AMMs, Uniswap made headlines in mainstream media because it actually surpassed Coinbase in transaction volume. Right, so that was before any liquidity subsidies. So I think it definitely have to. Do I mean, make it even more liquid, even in some pairs where the traditional exchanges were dominant up until that point. But in general, I think the rise of AMMs was uh, unstoppable even before that. And second, I think it's also an unfair comparison um, because you really, like a if you start a traditional exchange like FTX, then you raise venture capital typically, or what they did is they sold a token and raised hundreds of millions of dollars from, well, from the market basically. And then that flowed back into their market making operations. But usually when you, when you start like starting a traditional exchange is very difficult. It has the same problems of bootstrapping liquidity. Um, you won't get any takers unless they're makers. So 
they all start out either by making markets on their own exchange or, and I mean, a lot, a lot of exchanges get super wrecked making markets on their own exchange because market making is very, very difficult. And um, what you, this is like, when you're, the, when you're making markets in a poor way on your own exchange, what, what happens is you attract the, the smart takers who will pick you off whenever you're quoting some, like a wrong price and you will bleed out hundreds of millions of dollars um, over the first years of your operation. So what they tend to do is they take that, the, the money that they raised and they incentivize basically market making by professional market making firms. And they also pay. So this is just the same. This is just they pay liquidity rewards for market makers. So it would be really unfair to, to say, well, AMMs only took off because of liquidity mining because they, they used uh, kind of subsidies to attract market makers while order book based exchanges do the exact same thing and nobody talks about it right so i mean either we we accept it in both or um i mean we, you would see none of these large exchanges if they would give maker rebates that's a very good point but how sticky do you think the the liquidity provision is sushi swap um for the liquidity from uniswap and then they kind of forked it back And uh, then Uniswap kind of uh, upgraded to V2. And basically, I mean, all of them, a lot of the liquidity kind of migrated incredibly quickly. So uh, what, what, what's the sticky part here, actually? I mean, is it the brand Uniswap or is it, I mean, it can't be the contract, right? I think if you, if you take a step back, right, the, the stickiness is in the market itself. Regardless of which contract it's in, there are people who, with assets willing to provide liquidity regardless of whether it's in sushi swap or curve or uniswap or whatever right so i think when people look at it and, and go oh well it went from here to here to here and it's bouncing around like those people are optimizing for the best yield they can get at that time but they have bought into the idea that providing liquidity being an lp in an amm is a thing right so some amm liquidity is going to exist it's it's kind of created this network effect which i don't think is going anywhere Yeah, and I think this touches on a very important question, which is what are we actually incentivizing? I mean, and so this is what synthetics is so good at, in my view, because they only incentivize liquidity when they have actually a thesis that they want to invalidate, and they know exactly what they want to test. And when you, but when you create these like large scale incentives for 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 market makers in in, in like Uniswap, for example, or SushiSwap. It doesn't seem as focused. It's like, what is the, I mean, so in my opinion, what they should incentivize is basically incentivize uh, to own the customer, like a focus on owning the customer. I think that is, that is the thing that is actually sticky, like the users who go to, to the Uniswap app and to then take basically their business there, because we know that for the LPs themselves, they can switch with the click of a button, right? But it's the users who are more sticky. And it's, it's not sure yet that um, a system like Uniswap or like SushiSwap, they, that they can own uh, any customers long term. Or if basically the customer will be entirely owned by aggregators like OneInch or Matcha, who basically just search the market for the best route and then they route the, the, the user's order through there. And they, they are the ones charging them, then all the fees on top of it. Or if, maybe if it goes even a step further than that, if, if it will be MetaMask or Argent Wallet or Coinbase Wallet who will end up owning the customer. So we have no idea yet at this part of the market cycle, in my opinion. So it could be that like all of this liquidity incentivization will be for naught in the end in AMMs. I think that's entirely possible. So Kane, at the beginning of the episode, you mentioned that like, You know, liquidity mining is most useful when you're trying to like create a network effect. So how do you explain this sort of like uni token where it's like, you know, Uniswap clearly within the DeFi space has already such a strong network effect. What was the point of introducing liquidity mining there? I mean, it, it was pretty obviously a, a reaction, right? Um, you know, I, I think there was, there was, an intent at some point to deploy a token. And like, I'm maybe the most out there person uh, that I know of in terms of like, 
you know, and have been for a long time in terms of like token uh, maximalism, right? Like I believe that tokens are inherently valuable and I think the design space of tokens and, and using them as coordination mechanisms, it, we're not even like close to having explored it, right? I, I think that there's so much more that we can uh, we can do around like coordinating you know behavior. And so when we look at Uniswap and say like, okay, was it that effective? Like, is it kind of wasting? Like, probably, honestly. Like, if I if I have to you know be totally honest, I, I think it is. But it's also distributing the token and someone needs to decide whether they want to hold it or not um and therefore what they will what they will do right like there's there's some long-term alignment in terms of people who are holding uni tokens so i mean what you needed interestingly that a lot of the other liquidity mining uh programs didn't do is they they did this backward distribution right so basically anyone who kind of was a regular and possibly even privacy conscious Uniswap user, you know, over the past year or so, got a lot of uni tokens. <laughs> so don't you think that the, the the way that Uniswap actually did the distribution um kind of targeted a an organic distribution of the uni tokens among the users more than the forward usage? I mean, I think it was kind of a second order effect, right? I don't know if it was if it was the primary goal to do that or not. What I will say though is that it did what I had kind of described earlier, right? Which was establish for a ton of people a zero cost base on their uni holding, right? So of course, some people, you know, if you give them something for free, you're going to dump it, of course, right? Um, you know, but the market was pretty happy to kind of absorb that selling. Um, and we found an equilibrium fairly quickly. And we're now in a position where there's a lot of people who are still holding those uni tokens that are very bought in, uh, you know, to the project. Um, the one issue I think that, that Uniswap has is because the token is so new, they haven't had a chance to kind of get that community in the way that like some of the other uh, projects out there have, like a, you know, an Aave or, um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of examples like, you know, where the token has been around long enough that a community's kind of formed. Like there's a lot of Uniswap users out there, but if you go into the, I mean, I remember being in the Uniswap Discord and just being like, this is fucking incomprehensible what these guys are talking about, right? Like there are a bunch of engineers in there and it was very smart people talking about very hard problems. And I thought it was cool, but it was like way above my pay grade, right? I don't think that there were that many uh, people in there that were like talking about like usability or like excited about the project, like from a user perspective. And I don't think that community has ever really kind of emerged, like even from what I've seen, uh, you know, to date. So at some point that needs to happen if, Uniswap is going to have like a, you know, user driven, community driven brand awareness and, and growth mechanism. And I just don't think it has that now. It's getting away without it, but it would be far more beneficial if it had it. Yeah, that's one of the main benefits of a token, right? In my opinion, that it, it crystallizes community. Um, there's way less just incentive to engage in a community uh, that doesn't have a token if you're not because you're not financially invested in it. Whereas with projects that do have a token and you have this kind of double incentive to be part of that community. Could talk about as well about the retroactive distribution of Uniswap. So um, I think that goes back to the two goals for liquidity mining, which is one, distributing the initial supply. And second is to basically incentivize future behavior, right? And um, you're, you're totally right that if you retroactively distribute tokens, like what's that going to do for behavior of people in the future, at least not in a very direct way. But I mean, the second aspect is also important. And if you think about what, what happens every time when you say, okay, the people with the biggest pockets get all of the tokens in a highly predictable way, then you always get the same outcome. It's the same three to four firms that own 90% of your tokens. We've seen this with many projects. And I mean, you, most people don't really notice that, right? But it's true. That's why projects are looking for ways to distribute some tokens also in a way that is not, where, where, but just the amount of capital that you have is not the only factor that is, is looked at. But other factors are, are so hard to, 
to do like in a non-gameable way. And the only way, or like the way that Uniswap did it, which was way, very elegant, is to look at something that has already happened because then it cannot be gamed anymore. And um, giving it away to, the, to these early adopters, I thought was um, was a, a great way that I I would think that some other projects will probably copy in in some small way at least. So in a in a way, Uniswap actually did a one eighty, right? So basically, I mean, they they were always this uh, community darling, and then I know a lot of people who personally would have loved to invest into Uniswap, but instead they actually went the VC route. And then kind of after the entire sushi thing happened and their liquidity was fucked, they kind of uh, came up with this uni token and gave it out to the community. Do you think that was, I mean, obviously that can't have been intended, or at least that's my stance that it probably wasn't intended from the get-go. Do you think this will kind of put an end to to, to these VC offerings um, of, you know, fairly established projects in the space. Do you think, um, I mean, Kane, we all know that you're a token maximalist, but do you think, I mean, Uni could have, Uniswap could have done a token earlier, right? Instead of going to VCs. Do you think we'll see that more and more? I think the reason why they didn't do a token is not because it was a choice between VCs and, and selling a token, right? I, I think it was anti-token uh rhetoric that had like infected the core ethereum community of which you know hayden was was paying a lot of attention to right there were a lot of people within the community that had a uh, very deep distaste for what happened in 2017 right and even all the way going back to 2016 right like this idea that if you had you know created a token ever read the erc20 contract whatever like you know if you'd even come within you know 100 feet of it that there was some kind of like black mark against your name right and that was like deeply embedded in the community for a while which was this just very visceral reaction to the craziness of of the ico boom and i think it it overcorrected massively and i think had that not happened hayden probably would have been much more open to doing a token and maybe it would have been like VCs and, and, you know, uh, a token in parallel or something like that. But there was very clear and obvious anti-token kind of stance from a lot of projects at the time, right? And they would even come out, and I don't think Hayden did this, right? Um, but, like, a lot of people would come out and, like, you know, even use it as, like, oh, we didn't do a token, right? Like, go to their website and, like, the first fucking line is, like, we didn't sell a token, we never did an ICO. Like, that was, like... a you know, like a, a rallying cry, like for a long time, right, in the community. And I just think that was misguided. I, I think it just, it was not really, uh, you know, beneficial in the end. It, it was an overcorrection. I think that there's, um, there's kind of, you have a market cycle within the market cycle in, in crypto and acceptance for tokens is definitely one of them. So everything needed a token even stuff that really doesn't need a token 2016 17 and then now we i feel like we are maybe a bit overcorrecting in the other direction right now so right now like everything that can have a token should have a token even if it maybe doesn't make sense like you see this with governance right so governance is not just i mean governance is used as an ex excuse right now to launch tokens when the governance is really not something good for the project, but it's more of an attack vector than than actually is, is, is maybe necessary for, for the project to work. I mean, on something like Compound, right, you could argue that um, there needs to be someone who sets the safe collateral limits, who can add new tokens, uh, like approve them and um, tune the interest curve and whatnot. Turun, so, right? That, that should be Turun just uh, sitting in his ivory tower, just tweaking all of the components. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. I think that's where they're going, right? It's it's uh, parameterized uh, tuning of as a service, right? Yeah, and then get paid in kind of tokens or fees. Very interesting business model. But yeah, I mean, you can have other other projects. Like, I mean, for Uniswap, definitely, you can argue that a token has a lot of benefits to them in terms of crystallizing community. But like, what is really the the benefit beyond that, right? Luckily, we haven't really seen any big takedown of project with governance tokens where they're kind of rogue approved some kind of dramatic change and stole customer funds. I mean, we could have seen it with Maker where 
anyone could have like i think it was like four percent of the total mkr supply that would have been enough to stake them on a new executive contract and that contract could have paid a billion dollars to have the hacker right and um and now a bit later we saw that the maker approval was actually uh, a maker proposal was was approved with a flash loan so we kind of saw the first interaction between those two concepts and um I think we are getting, like, we are getting, we will get to a point where um, the community starts to see governance tokens as, as a risk vector again, and then we might see a correction the in the other uh, in the other direction again, in my opinion. What are some projects right now that you think would most benefit from some sort of liquidity mining system that maybe don't have it now? Tornado cash. I mean, yeah, anyway, that's a long story. Um, we've been talking about that with the, the, the two Romans for a long time. Um, and I think, I think it will get one, um, you know, uh, and I think they maybe in the early days fell into that same, you know, anti-token mindset a little bit, you know, and I don't think you need, you don't need a token to build a project clearly, right? And you don't even necessarily need a token to govern a project. I mean, even with us, right? Like our, our recent governance moves, the fact that we're not even using the token as the waiting for governance anymore. We're actually using your percentage of the debt pool that you represent, right? Which doesn't even really ne- like necessitate a token at all. Like we could have another form of collateral and then be weighting it against the debt pool. And, you know, so there's other, I mean, this goes back to the, the point, um, you know, that I, I think you made something about like, you can read anything. Like we can, we could use like your Uniswap holding as like our governance, right? If we wanted to, like, you know, if you're a Uniswap LP, you can come and govern synthetics. Like there's nothing stopping us from doing like any arbitrary uh, kind of, you know, read um, within the, the Ethereum state and then using that as governance, right? So I think you can still govern a thing. It's just a question of like, is the incentive alignment going to be right there if we're using uniswap lps to govern synthetics like is there any you know misalignment there and i I think in some cases yes in some cases maybe no i give another answer so what project would benefit most from liquidity mining and i would say the lightning network (laughs) uh, for bitcoin and really any layer too right you have the same problem on ethereum Um, you're gonna have this problem with optimism um, and other chains any layer two is a, the, a basically a blockchain of its own and um, starts with zero network effect. And so I think um, you will see liquidity mining there in order to basically bootstrap the, the network effect. And I'm like, I'm way more optimistic that optimism will succeed with that than the Lightning Network will because of this aversion against tokens that's very unfortunate. I just went down like a like a micro rabbit hole there for a second. Like I, I feel like if you did try to propose some protocol incentives to the Lightning Network, A it would be contentious. Everything's contentious. It's Bitcoin, right? Um, but B, you would need to like it would end up with some like contentious hard fork, right? Where like one version actually incentivized Lightning Network and the other one, you know, like big block, small block kind of uh, you know internecine battle, right? And I, like, I think maybe ironically, the like Lightning Network incentivized version of Bitcoin that like pays out like, you know, BTC level, uh, you know, block rewards to, to the Lightning Network could actually be more successful. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure it would lead to a fork. The, the interesting thing is you could do it in a way that doesn't break the Lightning Network. I mean, if you, if you would have like a second form of channel that pays out future equity in its routing fees to people who route th- like money through it today or whatever. I mean, that, that could exist in theory, right? And um, anyone could interact with it without partaking in the liquidity mining itself. So, I mean, but the reason that we don't see this is, of course, because of the huge social barrier against entertaining any form of token uh, in the Bitcoin community. So um, I don't think really it's the, it's the technical hurdles or it's even the threat of a hard fork it's purely like the kind of social pressure on anyone entertaining these ideas. It is possible to have the source of the liquidity mining incentives be from something other than 
the base protocol or like the lead development team. Not for Lightning that work. I was like once a couple of months ago considering trying to build some something for Interledger to do exactly this. Like how do we create incentives for people to participate in the Interledger network? Or even like before the Uni token was launched, there was this like short-lived project called UniDAO, which was like, it was just this like reaction to the sushi swap where they were like, oh, let's airdrop tokens to all the Uniswap LPs. And they asked me to be a multi-sig signer for that. So I'm like, sure. I wasn't other involved too much otherwise. But like, so far, we haven't seen one of these like really take off where like all the liquidity mining has always come from the protocol or from the lead development team. But do you think we will see some successful ones from other sources eventually? It's a very interesting um, question for sure. I mean, in theory, we have this huge um, developer funding system or builder on Bitcoin, right? That's very mature. Um, you have a lot of grant giving institutions and in theory, nothing prevents these same institutions to prov- like incentivize liquidity on the Lightning Network if they think that's the best thing to make Bitcoin grow. You don't necessarily have to pay developers. You can also pay liquidity providers. I think that's totally viable. I don't think we'll see it in Bitcoin, but um, in general, I could imagine like, for example, the Ethereum Foundation or any kind of other foundation could also do this kind of incentivized these kind of pro- these kind of programs. In in a way, if you think about it, Sushi Swap for a while was basically incentivizing liquidity on Uniswap. Yes, <laughs> I was totally saying. right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think when there's like a power vacuum, right? Like when there's no clear intent to to kind of step in. That's when the opportunity arises for someone to say, "Well, if it's not going to coordinate itself, then we'll." create this new coordination mechanism that maybe exists outside of like whatever the core team or project or, you know, and and go and do it on their behalf, right? Like there's nothing stopping anyone from, from doing something like that. So, you know, it's, it's certainly possible in the future if there's protocols that aren't doing much for that to happen. And so far we have only talked about things that benefit a protocol, right? Um, at least in like, like you can incentivize uh, liquidity in something like Uniswap to drive more liquidity to it. But then we see, we saw Sushi Swap, which, which was the first, in sense, um, the first instance of, okay, let's create liquidity to take something away from someone else. And I mean, this always kind of exists, right? Um, you probably saw Tarun's paper saying that like proof of stake always competes with the yields provided by DeFi, for example, right? So and if DeFi yields are very high, then proof of stake system could have very little money staked and therefore be very ins- insecure as a base layer. But so that just goes to show that like liquidity always competes with each other on, on even like global scale. But Sushi Swap was a very direct attack on the on the liquidity of Uniswap to pull that over. But I mean, ultimately, nothing would stop, let's say, like a nation state to incentivize miners for example to join the mining pool and that mining pool uh censors basically non-whitelisted transactions or whatever right so th- that is the word of basically the this new era we are in right where, where anyone can create the incentive for anything in a permissionless way and um we are barely scratching i think the surface the surface of that and um there are some very scary some very scary possibilities there. Are there any good examples of liquidity mining sort of being done in pre-blockchain systems? I mean, I I think a lot of the growth, you know, I remember, I don't know what year it was, like in the late 2000s, reading the Andrew Chen, like growth hacking uh, ebook, right, that that he released for free. And like some of the examples, like yeah, that was mind blowing for me, right? Like at that time to, to read that because some of the examples were like so ingenious, right? Like, you know, the example of like Airbnb injecting their, like, you know, basically uh, tapping into the Craigslist, not even like an API, there wasn't an API at the time, but like into their like uh, front end flow, right? To, uh, to you know, uh, post listings, right? And so they like basically were able to like, create this weird like overlay on top of Craigslist that would allow anyone to just cross post 
their Airbnb listing to Craigslist, right? Which obviously had much bigger network effects. Like that actually pulled value. Like Craigslist was getting value out of people paying, you know, to or like from you know uh, ad impressions or whatever, paying to view that content, right? Those uh, and it was one of the big like uh, categories within Craigslist, right? And all of a sudden there was this like parasitic entity that uh that you know pulled and then like obviously did like it, you know craigslist i don't think has uh you know for i mean maybe like for rentals right but like short-term rentals i think that game is up right um so i think there are examples where you know if something is not well defended people can turn up and siphon off in this case like rental liquidity i don't know i don't know exactly what the best term is for it but like and and i think a, a number of the other examples were very not nefarious but certainly a little bit underhanded right like taking advantage of someone who's like slow moving and not really paying attention to what was going on they were a startup they were fast they had the tech and they built some cool things to just inject themselves into this flow of some other larger lumbering beast like uh, craigslist and and you know siphon off their users or attention or money or whatever yeah i guess depending on how you define liquidity mining you can find examples that go back to the beginning of time. I think one thing that basically the blockchain has enabled or has upgraded liquidity mining in that sense is that a lot of things that can be now cryptographically verified that, that the work actually happened and that that often enables the work itself to be done in a permissionless way and you know, by anyone in the world without having like to KYC and so on. So that, that I think is. It, it kind of puts these kind of liquidity incentives into, it globalizes them and dem democratizes them in a way. I feel like another piece was like, you know, oftentimes past liquidity incentives, it's very easy or it's easier for like companies to airdrop like dollars to users, but like airdropping their own company's shares is like not really feasible in a traditional world. Yeah, totally. It's kind of frowned upon, yeah. Do you think uh, there's going to be an increase in more traditional companies doing this? Like, I don't know if you guys saw the Snapchat announcement where they like are giving away like a million dollars a year for like the top snaps on their platform and stuff. Well, a million dollars is still not equity, right? I mean, it's the, you're still not an owner of the business. So which company was it a few days ago that asked to IPO with security tokens? I'm not sure, but I read some proposal like that. I mean, ultimately... I think you would see a lot of equity exist on a blockchain. And I think once you're there, then it will be way easier to uh, distribute these shares as well to like, yeah, users of that blockchain. I think you would see a convergence between the two worlds. Is the typical DeFi user not a lot more risk taking than the average human? I mean, do you think, do you think the same mechanisms will work on average Joe than did on DeFi Joe? I think so. I mean, it, it really, you know, it, it depends. I, I guess the longer term incentive uh, of owning like some aspect of a thing, right? Like, you know, if you think about, you know, a, a lot of marketplace uh, network effects, right? Like, you know, things like, you know, Amazon, et cetera, uh, when, when the third party marketplaces were, um, were launched, it was really hard to get people to participate because you know there was this idea that there was cannibalization right like they were just going to cannibalize their own uh revenue from their direct business or, or whatever i think you could temper that concern significantly by saying well you're going to have you know if you participate in this new marketplace that we're setting up you will have some longer term ownership of it right but i feel like there's someone who's running a business who kind of understands what the potential value of that is versus like an end user, it's maybe a little bit harder to, to you know, I, I don't think DeFi users are like end users in the sense that we would normally describe them, right? Like they're, they're a little bit more uh, involved in the process. Um, so I don't know is the, the honest answer, like whether that will extend to like everyone everywhere. Um, but it's certainly worth trying. Let's see. You could see it in a way, even as, you know, some sort of antitrust action, right? Because if you look at traditional marketplaces, I mean, there's always a natural monopoly that emerges. If you say, look, th there is a monopoly and we kind of accept that, but it's not going to be a company, it's going to be a DAO, or it's going to be, you know, the users as a group. 
uh, then obviously having a mon monopoly is way less concerning than it would otherwise be. And, and I think there's a, another critical component to it as well, which is like barriers to entry. So, you know, if you have an incumbent that has a, a pseudo monopoly or whatever, that's a DAO, right, and doesn't have the ability to coordinate, institute some sort of regulatory capture such that their, you know, poor position in the market is, is maintained through, you know, some like extra market activity, right? Like that's outside of, you know, just uh, operating and, and being efficient, then I think it's okay, right? If the Dow, you know, captures <laughs> the U.S. government and you know has a bunch of uh, senators or whatever in their pocket, then I think it's equally bad, right? Like we don't want inefficient markets, even if they're owned by everyone. I think that's still like a, a net negative outcome for for everyone. I think um, it's my theory that we go to. I mean, we are talking a lot about breaking up monopolies right now and decentralizing the world, but. I think that crypto can also have the opposite effect because of how much more difficult it is to capture value in crypto. And um, I think this will lead to there being even fewer, even larger winners who then emerge, right? So I think crypto is all about networks and network effect. And I, I think we could see um, like if some, something like crypto could have the effect that like we replace like three large companies with one huge network, right? And, um, and that will be a monopoly of its own then. But I think the switching costs are so low, right? And this is, I think, the critical thing. Like provided the switching costs to go from Uniswap to SushiSwap, if, if SushiSwap is able to come in and, uh, you know, create a slight tweak to the Uniswap model that is much more efficient and everyone can switch very easily and coordinating it is, is not hard, then I think it's okay. I think that's fine. Like then you just have, you know, this chain of behemoth, decentralized entities that like constantly getting replaced. I think that's actually an okay outcome. Yeah, that's, that, that will be a fascinating outcome for sure. I think that that's the, the big promise, right? Of, of crypto is to, to lower the exit cost for the user, create more competition by being open source and forkable and having these, anyone being able to bootstrap incentives basically from thin air, right? In traditional markets, you have to have access to capital upfront from some kind of venture venture fund or whatever in order to even compete with an incumbent business. But in crypto, you can, like so far at least, you can just create your own token and say, hey, this basically stands for any future revenue we generate and, um, and then let price discovery run. And, and very often these tokens will then be re regarded very highly by the market and... Uh, so it definitely lowers the barrier to entry for like for competing in the market and it lowers the barrier to exit for the user, which is in both cases very good. I think this is actually quite a nice note to, to end on. It's a, you know, a, a good outlook. So uh, Kane and Hazu, thank you both for coming on so much. It was uh, fascinating. Thank you. It was really fun. Thank you. It was, it was our pleasure. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter, and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>